welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today, we welcome back on the show Samara Friedman. She's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. She's going to share her story in her Kevin MD article titled A Nut Allergy Nightmare at 35,000 Feet. Samara, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. So we'll get into your story and article in a little bit, but for those who didn't get a chance to listen to our first episode together, just briefly share your story and journey to where you're at today. So I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. I knew from a very young age that I wanted to become a physician and pretty young also prior to college that I decided orthopedic surgery. And I pretty much pursued that straight through and now I'm practicing in a private practice in Northern New Jersey. Wonderful. And you had this really, really detailed and vivid story that you shared in this Kevin MD article. And for those of you get a chance to read it and experience it through your words, just tell my audience about that. So basically I was on an airplane and got that call that most of us get at some point in our career. Uh, is there a doctor on board? Mm -hmm. And I usually do, even as an orthopedist where my medical knowledge might not be quite as up to date as a more general practitioner or emergency room doctor. I do try to volunteer because you never know who else might be available. I also like to set a good example for my children. And I always try to volunteer when they do make that call for a doctor on board, which has happened twice so far to me with, with travel. So I volunteered to respond to whatever medical emergency this was. They took down my seat number. They said, we'll let you know if we, if we need you. And then once I thought everything was well taken care of, they showed up back at my seat asking for me to potentially assist. And what I found out was that this was a college student who had eaten the food on the airplane mm -hmm. and realized after doing so that there was nuts within the food and that she had a nut allergy. She also couldn't find her EpiPens that may have been left with her parents who were on a separate flight. And she, uh, was having a reaction that she wasn't sure if it was serious or not, if it was anaphylaxis, but a nurse initially also responded. They asked the nurse for their expertise because they didn't want to bother a doctor if they didn't need to. And that nurse gave her some Benadryl. And when she didn't respond said, maybe it's a panic tech attack. Why don't you sit down, relax and see how things go. Now, what kind of symptoms did this person experience? Like what was she experiencing that, that caused them to be of concern? So she was having a somewhat copiously running nose. She felt like her heart was beating quickly. She felt anxious, which is a common symptom in anaphylaxis also. And at that point, she didn't have hives. She wasn't wheezing, but she did have some irritation of her stomach, a little nausea, runny nose, anxious, heart racing. And she wasn't sure if Again, if this was an anaphylactic reaction, a reaction to the nuts, or if she was just panicked. And about how old was she? She was 20. 20. Okay. So the nurse had given her some Benadryl and then the flight staff called you up to see her and now you're there. What happened next? Right. Also, I should mention her, her throat felt itchy as well. So I kind of took her history. She hadn't had anaphylaxis previously. She was always able to eat things that had been made in a facility with nuts, but just never ate something with nuts in it more than just a cross contaminant. And she was really concerned about, again, the itchy throat. Her nose was running and her pulse was a little bit fast, but she was stable. She was able to converse with me without difficulty. And after some deliberation, I decided you know, if this is anaphylaxis and it's not properly treated, not expeditionally treated, the ramifications could be disastrous. Mm -hmm. She could, you know, decompensate, end up being in a situation where maybe epinephrine wouldn't be effective at that point anymore. If it was just a panic attack, then unfortunately she received a painful shot of epinephrine that she didn't need, but the side effects would be minor. So given the limited medical resources on an airplane, I decided the right call was unquestionably give the epinephrine and see how she responds. Because if you don't, and it could be disastrous. 
Now, the epinephrine, was that part of the flight kit or was it just from another passenger on a plane? So I had epinephrine with me in an auto injector because as you know from the article, my son is anaphylactic to tree nuts and I always carry a number of EpiPens on me, this form being an AviQ pen. And I was willing to use it if need be, if the flight didn't have their own supply of epinephrine, but I also didn't want to use it if I didn't have to use it because he might need it and he might need multiple doses. And he has had anaphylaxis in the past and he does react to a cross contamination. And we were on our way to a country that uses a lot of nuts in their cooking. So I had EpiPens if I needed, but there was a flight kit. We went through the flight kit. The flight kit did have epinephrine, but not in an auto injector mm -hmm. and not in the right concentration for anaphylaxis. So in general, what else is in a typical flight kit or was in a flight kit in that flight that you were on? So they had a sort of a trifold packet of a dizzying array of medications. And I can't say I recall exactly what other things were there because I was just looking down the list to find epinephrine. So they had a list, very small print, and being in my mid forties at this point in time, it's getting a little harder to read that small print very quickly. And I saw that there was epinephrine in the packaging. And then we went through this trifold trying to find it pretty quickly. And it turned out that they only had it in a concentration that was meant for cardiac arrest mm. and that I had to convert this into a form that was both a concentration and a form that I can inject for anaphylaxis because it was contained within a Brister jet device, which I was completely unfamiliar with. And it's not a device that you can just do a sub Q or IM injection with. So I had to MacGyver this epinephrine from this Brister jet device and figure out how to get it into a separate needle and syringe that I could give for an IM or sub Q injection and also translate the concentration into the correct dosage for, for this young lady. That seems like a pretty cumbersome process for what is not an uncommon event. As far as you know, are EpiPens generally not included in flight kits? EpiPens are expensive. Now, they, the airlines may have a deal with a pharmaceutical company if they're buying them in bulk, that they get them a little less expensive than we do. But we've paid up to $600 for a two-pack of epinephrine when it was at its worst, when there were no competitors, no AviQ. Now it's still expensive, but it can cost me a few hundred dollars. And that's a big cost for an airline for a medication that theoretically expires in a year, which is what it at least says on the AviQ injector and the epinephrine injector. So I'm sure the airline could afford it. They probably prefer not to. And they just push that off to you know, the doctors that have to deal with it when the issue arises. They could easily though, just have an ampule of epinephrine or a vial of epinephrine in the right doses to use for anaphylaxis. I think a good number of physicians would know how to just draw up epinephrine from a vial and inject it, but they might not know the right dosage for anaphylaxis. If I didn't have a child who's anaphylactic as an orthopedic surgeon, I don't think I would have known the proper dosage for anaphylaxis. I use maybe three or four medications in total in my practice. I write for ANSEF, I write for a few pain meds, that is all I do as an orthopedic surgeon in terms of medication prescribing. So to know the dosage of anaphylactic medications offhand would pretty, be pretty unusual for a typical orthopedic surgeon that doesn't have a personal reason for knowing that. So I do think it's worthwhile to have the auto injectors on the flight. A flight attendant could use it. Mm -hmm. A paramedic could use it. A nurse could use it. So I think it's important to push forward and have that included on flights. It's a, one of the top 20 causes of a medical problem in the air, as I recently found out after doing this article and receiving a lot of feedback and additional information from people. Well, tell us what happened next in your story. So I did figure out how to give her the correct dosage. I injected it, but the volume was about 10 times the volume of an auto injector because 
the concentration was 10 times more dilute. So instead of 0.3 ml injected into her leg, it was 3 ml. Very painful for her, but thankfully she responded. And within minutes of giving her that nephrine, the itchy throat resolved, the runny nose resolved, her pulse returned to normal, and she just felt less anxious, that less, less of that sense of impending doom that you often feel with anaphylaxis. And then after that, did you observe her? How much longer in the flight was there? So there was about five hours left in the flight. I observed her for about one hour. She felt fine. The flight attendants were very helpful. They said they would observe her themselves and let me know immediately if anything changed and suggested I take a break and get a little bit of rest on this flight. Now, is it common for flights to have nuts in their meals on a plane? Unfortunately, it's more common than you would think. Most of the time, there are things made in a facility with nuts, which some people with nut allergies can tolerate, others cannot. My son is one of those who cannot. But to have it in, as part of the meal, I found was particularly surprising and disturbing because this is such a common problem. You're gonna have in a flight of 300, 400 people, at least three, four, if not more people who can't eat this food. And if they're not vigilant, and most of the times we are, but we're human, mistakes happen, you're going to have people who are going to have a medical emergency on the flight. And flight diversions cost the airlines, if they had to divert, a good five-figure amount, if not even six-figure, depending on the situation of the particular airline. You'd think with something that costly to them, because it comes down to a bottom line with mm -hmm. the airlines, they're a business, that they would quite simply just not serve nuts. And yet that is not the case. And while I didn't think that they serve nuts as snacks anymore, turns out as a person who doesn't typically fly first class, I found out from people who do, that they do often serve warm nuts in first class still. And that just astounds me. Now you said that you got a lot of feedback after sharing your story online and your story certainly resonated with 2000 plus social media shares. What kind of feedback did you get? The feedback I got was generally very positive from people. They appreciated knowing this story and what concerns they may have to address, particularly if they're physicians upon a flight, including that they might not be able to find an auto injector, that they may have to um, adjust dosages of things to figure out the right dosage of epinephrine to give someone. I also found that there's an app that is called FlightRx, and it lists on the app the 23 most common flight emergencies and what signs and symptoms to look for, what is the treatment with dosages. I have now downloaded that app. So if I run into something where I do have an idea of what the medical issue is, but not an allergy, where, again, my layman's expertise lies, that I might be able to still help somebody on a flight know the correct dosages of medications, even though I don't have an internet connection. So I think it's a wonderful service to just have this app available for doctors who are in different specialties other than your more primary care related and be able to help someone on a flight that they might not otherwise be able to help. I also found that the AMA is now pushing for legislation to require auto injectors on the airplanes as of 2022, they've made that an initiative. And my concern also though, in again, receiving additional information from people is that there always seems to be loopholes. So about eight, 10 years ago, it was required to have automatic blood pressure cuffs on airplanes because it's very hard to hear through a stethoscope with that background noise. And my plane actually had that. But the last time I responded to an emergency on a plane, which is about six years ago, they did not have that. And I heard from other people that they've been on flights recently where they did not have that and that there are loopholes in these regulations that, the, that these airplanes are able to avoid the most recent and helpful recommendations. So that's also a concern. We're talking to Samara Friedman. She's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and she's talking about her Kevin M. The article, A Nut Allergy Nightmare at 35,000 Feet. Samara, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin M. The audience? 
So I think first and foremost, that there needs to be more of a push for the airlines to be accountable for what they are serving. They have kosher friendly meals, vegetarian friendly meals. I don't see why they can't make an effort for a life-saving change to have meals with that are free of the top eight allergens, at least that much, whether it just be a fruit plate or something that these children and now adults can eat safely on an airplane. Why there aren't auto injectors so that anybody, whether they have a medical degree or an EMT license or a pharmacist perhaps can help somebody on an airplane who's having a medical emergency where resources are probably more limited than almost any other situation. So these are things that are easy changes, but the airlines need to be pushed to do it. And if it means convincing them financially, if they don't want to be good Samaritans about it, then whatever it takes, they need to make these changes. Samara, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. Thanks again for coming back on the show. Thank you so much.